Hello everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Izzy, if you don't know me, and today I'm going to be talking about the case of Amy Mahalovic. Amy was only 10 years old when she went missing from her local shopping center and she was never to be seen alive again. Her case is still open three decades later and remains unsolved with no one having ever been arrested for her crime. But for some people, they feel that this case isn't so much of a mystery and the person that could have done this to Amy could be right in front of us. So let's get into it. So Amy was born in Little Rock, Arkansas on December 11th, 1978 to parents Margaret McNulty and Mark Mahalovec, and she had an older brother named Jason. At the time of this case, all four of them lived in Bay Village, Ohio, which is just outside of Cleveland. Bay Village is a relatively small town and only has a population of about 15,000, but was rated one of the best places to live in Ohio. Amy's family lived in a quiet little cul-de-sac. This was the type of neighborhood where all the kids were always outside playing, the parents felt comfortable letting them play outside, all the parents and neighbors knew each other, and everyone was just really friendly. Amy was described as a kind, smart young girl, and everyone who knew her said that she would have a bright future ahead of her. She was actually in the gifted class at the school she went to, Bay Village Middle School, and she loved to read and draw. She also wanted to be what I think that most 10-year-old girls want to be at this time, including me, which was a veterinarian. She really had a passion for dogs and horses. She actually took horseback riding lessons and just loved all animals. All of Amy's friends loved hanging out with her. She was known by her friends to be sweet and fun, just a generally really kind person. So the day that starts this three decade long tragedy is October 27th, 1989. And it starts off like any other day for Amy. She had breakfast, she got dressed. Specifically this day, she was wearing black boots with these little silver buttons and she had horse earrings. They were like silver and turquoise because of her passion for horses and everything was going on how it normally did. She had actually told her parents that morning that she had a choir audition after school and her parents were really excited for her because she was pushing herself out of her comfort zone and they really wanted to support her. So other than the fact that she would probably be home a little bit later from school than normal, everything was like any other day. And every day she would ride her bike to school and this day was no different. At around 7.20, 20 a.m. she rode her bike to school because she only lived a couple of blocks away from school. Amy usually rode with her best friend Christy who actually lived only a few blocks away from her as well but this day for some reason they didn't but she still made it to school okay and school started at 7 45. On that day actually a young police officer named Mark Spatzel had actually come to Amy's classroom because he was giving a speech on stranger danger and Amy and her best friend Christy sat and listened to the whole thing. He talked about basic things like not going with a stranger, letting your parents know if there was anyone weird lurking around, stuff like that. So lunchtime comes and this is the first mention of something weird and this is to another one of Amy's friends. Amy mentions something to this friend that no one knew up to this point and she mentions that she got a call from an unknown man. She says that a few days prior she had gotten this phone call from this man that supposedly worked with her mother and he wanted to take Amy shopping for a present for her mom because her mom had just actually gotten a promotion at work. He wanted to take her to the Bay Village strip mall and she seemed pretty excited about this. But right after she was done telling the friend this, she said, you can't tell anyone because the man said that she had to keep it a secret. Her friend brushes it off and this isn't surprising because kids at this age say stuff like that all the time. They say weird things or they joke around so her friend didn't really think much of it. Nonetheless, the day continues as normal and school ends at 2.04. Now Amy was supposed to go to this choir audition that she had told her parents about that morning but Amy doesn't actually go to choir auditions because they never existed in the first place. So she ends up going, walking to the Bay Village strip mall with some of her friends, which it was only about a quarter of a mile away from her school. And this wasn't abnormal for the middle schoolers to do. The Bay Village strip mall was kind of the it place for the kids this age, but she doesn't end up just hanging out with her friends. In the beginning, when they get there, her and her friends go to the Baskin Robbins, they hang out, 
but about 30 to 45 minutes later, she ends up breaking off from some of her friends. A couple minutes later, she's seen waiting by this black pole in the plaza, and it looks like she's waiting for someone, but her friends don't know who. Just a little bit later, she is seen talking with an unknown man who friends and acquaintances just assume is a family friend, an uncle maybe, because she seems relatively comfortable with him. At this time, the mall is bustling. People are milling around. Her friends are at the mall. People who know her from school are at the mall. The police station is actually right across the street from where Amy is waiting, but just 10 minutes after she is seen talking to this unknown man, she is gone. The last time that Amy was ever seen alive was walking through the Bay Village strip mall parking lot with this unknown man who had an arm kind of wrapped around her shoulder and it seemed like he was kind of guiding her. But again, she wasn't calling for help. She didn't seem uncomfortable. Nobody had any concerns up to this point. So now it is just after three in the afternoon and Jason, Amy's brother, is now getting home from school. He walks in the door and he thinks it's kind of weird because the house is super quiet and usually Amy's home now because she gets off of school a little bit earlier than Jason does. He ends up calling their mom, Margaret, and voicing his concerns to her that hey, Amy's not home, like, this is really weird. So Margaret explains to Jason that Amy had these choir auditions and she might be home a little bit later, but probably soon, and they end the call. Before Margaret can even dwindle on this for too long and before Jason can really start to get worried as the time goes on, Margaret ends up getting a call from Amy. Now, Amy usually called her mom after school. They had a really close relationship and Amy loved to call her mom every day after school and check how Margaret's day had went. So this wasn't abnormal. So on the phone, Margaret's talking to Amy and nothing is super weird. Amy is talking like normal. The only thing was that she seemed a little less like the chatterbox that she usually is because she was known to go on and on and to keep on talking about things. She was a little bit short with her replies. But other than that, Margaret doesn't even give a second thought to Amy's phone phone call. And with everything seeming normal to Margaret on the phone with Amy, she assumes that Amy has made it home safely because nothing that Amy is saying points to Amy not being home or being in trouble or anything like that. Margaret even tells Amy to get a snack and that she will see her at home in a little bit. So the last time that Amy was seen was in the Bay Village strip mall with this unknown man. And this is a true crime channel. We all know that she did not return home safely and Amy was not home at that point when she had made her, the call to her mom. Police, after finding out a timeline of events later on, after Amy was reported missing, had ended up realizing that when Amy placed the call to her mom, she was most likely with her kidnapper. This is wild and extremely risky for the kidnapper to let Amy make a phone call to her mom and for everything to seem completely fine to her mom. The level of trust and comfortability that the kidnapper must have felt with his relationship with Amy is crazy. So clearly up to this point, he has not raised any suspicions with Amy and she probably still thinks that he is a coworker of her mom's and is gonna help her get her mom a gift. He has also probably not done anything to make her think otherwise. A little bit later, we're gonna talk about the profile of this man and what we know now that the case has happened and all the investigating that went into it but for now we're gonna continue on the timeline. So at around 5.30 p.m., Amy's mom gets home from work and this is when panic starts to ensue for Margaret. She realizes that Amy is still not home and immediately thinks that something has happened. She drives to Amy's school and the sight that she finds is not assuring at all. She finds Amy's bike that she had rode to school that morning still on the bike rack, but Amy's nowhere to be found. At this point, she calls police and thankfully police are immediately cooperative and they immediately start taking action. She starts frantically calling all the immediate neighbors, asking if they've seen Amy. Maybe she's just at a neighbor's house or a friend's house and forgot to tell Margaret. But all the neighbors say that no, they have not seen Amy and she's not at any of their houses. Amy's dad, Mark, returns from a work trip later that night and after getting up to date with all the news about Amy missing, he ends up going to the strip mall with their dog and searching for her, but nothing comes up. 
So police and FBI are still searching and they're trying to find out what could have happened to Amy. They don't know if she's been taken yet or if she's ran away or if she's lost. They don't know anything up to this point, but they're just trying to get any information they can. Amy's case ends up making the news really quickly after getting the police involved. And this is when some of Amy's friends come forward with some news that police did not know up to this point. They end up telling police what Amy had said that day at school about this mysterious phone call from this unknown man who supposedly worked with Amy's mom. Once police are informed about this man, it immediately raises their concern because no one knows who this unknown man is and they realize that it could be a scheme that he could have taken Amy. So they soon realize that this was most likely planned and they immediately take action on trying to get a profile of this man out to the public. Two young girls who were acquaintances of Amy and had actually seen Amy at the strip mall waiting and then later talking with this man came forward giving descriptions, but they differed slightly, but in a very big way. One of the girls said that he had glasses and one didn't. And this is a big difference to have, but it was still something for the police to go off of, even though it wasn't super solid. In the news, police note that even though they have the sketch of this guy, it doesn't mean that it's an exact match to him. Either way, even if it wasn't super solid, it was a starting point and at least they had something. So the poster that the police ended up coming out with, with the sketch, had a profile of the man and also some characteristics and traits that he most likely exhibits. He was said to be likely 30 to 35 years old at this time. He was likely to be between 5'8 and 5'10 and had dark hair and possible glasses. When describing the kidnapper, they say that he is a planner, he's methodical, he's manipulative, and highly dangerous. Even though he's dangerous, he also likes kids and he can get kids to like him. He must have a trusting persona and some of the detectives even described him as a Ted Bundy type where he can appear charming and sweet on the outside, but then be very dangerous on the inside. This is one of the most dangerous types of criminals because he's not going to stand out as some weirdo or some creep, which makes it even more hard to locate and identify him. So as the case becomes bigger and gets more traction and Amy still hasn't been found as the days and weeks go on, police send out a letter to thousands of young girls that were around the same age as Amy in the neighboring towns and they get a shocking response. Two young girls in North Olmsted, which is only about 15 to 20 minutes away from Bay Village, had received almost identical phone calls to Amy a few weeks before Amy had gotten her phone call. Police end up believing that it is the same man that called these two girls, also called Amy. Thankfully, the girls did not meet him. They did not fall for his tricks. But one of the girls who had been called noted that it seemed like he could have been watching her because he would only call when her parents had just left and she was always home alone when he called. It was right as soon as she was home alone, she would get the phone call. So even though this could seem like a big thing, like, oh my gosh, a phone call, can't we trace it? Unfortunately, nothing came of these leads and while tens of thousands of tips came in over the next few months, each one was looked into and vetted and all of them ended up not being very useful. They all turned up with nothing. In the months that followed, Amy's parents were racked with grief. They were distraught, like their 10 year old little girl is missing and the police have no leads. This would be the most heartbreaking thing for a parent to not know where their child is and just to know that something most likely very bad has happened to her. But Amy's parents held out hope and Amy's mom, Margaret, even got Amy birthday presents for her birthday in December, but Amy's birthday came and went with no Amy. Amy's mom actually believed very strongly that Amy was still alive and could have been in their town or a neighboring town and that maybe someone took her who couldn't have children and wanted a child of their own. But on February 8th, 1990, a jogger would find something that would completely shatter this hope. 
In Ruggles Township, which was only about 50 miles away from Bay Village, a jogger was running her normal route and she was going down this kind of isolated rural farm road and she sees what at first she thinks is just like a light green sweatshirt. But as she comes closer, she realizes that it is a body and a young girl's body. It was apparent that whoever it was had been dead for some time because of the state of decomposition. Amazingly, the woman had actually heard about Amy's case because like I said, it was all over the news for months and she called police saying that she thought this could be Amy. After authorities came to try and identify the body, they did indeed match it to Amy. And she was wearing the same light green sweatsuit that she had been wearing the day she went missing. But those black boots that she was wearing that day and the horse head earrings that she was wearing and a school binder were all missing from her and her backpack, which was right next to her. It is believed that the killer took these things as some kind of trophy. Medical examiners end up saying once they take Amy's body in that she has been dead for a while, likely only a day or two after she was taken and that she had one meal before she was killed. It was some sort of soy product like chicken with soy or Chinese food, something like that. Medical examiners also found yellow or gold fibers on Amy's body. Unfortunately, because of the decomposition at this point, it was hard to get anything definitive with Amy's body, but medical examiners say that they suspect that Amy had been sexually assaulted because her underwear was on inside out when she was found. They were able to tell that she had been hit in the head, although this was not the cause of her death. This could have been some sort of defensive wound, maybe when she realized that this man was not who he said he was, and her actual cause of death was multiple stab wounds to the neck. When detectives are investigating all the areas where Amy's body was and surrounding it, they end up finding what is later the biggest pieces of evidence in Amy's case, and they could end up being key to solving Amy's case. 300 feet away from Amy's body, they ended up finding a blanket and a curtain, which appeared to be a quilt. You could be probably thinking, how are these How are these gonna be helpful? Because the blanket was pretty ordinary, but the curtain, on the other hand, was very unique and specific because it was handmade. It appeared that it wasn't always a curtain and that it could have been a quilt before, because it had added little hooks to make it a curtain. It was also an avocado green color and the stitching on the top of it was one way and then on the bottom it went another way. Police ended up finding canine hairs that had matched Amy's dog on the curtain and then later ended up finding Amy's hair on the curtain. So they were able to connect the curtain to Amy and believe that it was used some way in her crime, whether that was carrying her or something else. Because of the uniqueness of this curtain, police really tried to get the image of it spread because as I said, it could be a key to finding Amy's killer because it only takes one person to recognize this curtain and say, hey, that was my friend's curtain or a friend of a friend or a relative. But they really tried to push to get this image out there and they still believe to this day that it could be the key to blowing Amy's case wide open. The location was also very specific because it was isolated, like I said. It wasn't just a road right off the highway. It was a road that you would have had to have a connection to to even know it existed. The road was very out of the way. It was very rural. It was surrounded by farms. And because of this specificity of the location, police believe the killer had a specific connection to this road or area, whether that is he worked there, he grew up there, had a friend around there, he drove that route for traveling, it could be anything. But either way, this culprit knew the road and knew it well, and police believe that this could also be a very helpful fact for identifying the killer. Unfortunately, for the next 30 years, police and FBI get nowhere. They follow up on all new leads and tips, but they all go nowhere. Earlier, right when Amy had went missing, her family members, immediate and distant, had been cleared, and police really focused on local sex offenders, but they all had alibis. Several people actually confessed to the crime, but after they were investigated, police determined that none of those people had done it either and that is just that is just terrible for someone to confess to a crime and put amy's family all in upheaval again with false hope of maybe this is really the person who did it but then for them to fake it and just do it for attention or 
I don't even know why these people do it, but it's really messed up and it was probably really hard for Amy's family to go through. So no one is arrested and the case remains unsolved. In 2005, however, police do make a little progress in the case because they find a connection between the two girls that had said they got similar calls and Amy. And this connection is the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center in Bay Village. Each of the girls had gone to this science center in the weeks before they each received their phone calls, and they each had probably filled out the logbook with either their phone number, their address, and their names. Police tried to get copies of this logbook to see if they could find out who else had been at this center around the same times as the girls, but the Freedom of Information Act, which provides access of records, from federal agencies doesn't apply to this nature and science center because it's a private nonprofit and this act only applies to public authority. In January of 2019, which was only a few years ago, a new and very promising suspect ended up surfacing. A woman had actually came forward to police saying that her ex-boyfriend from all these years ago around the time of the crime, she believes him to have been involved in Amy's case. This man is Dean Runkle and he was born in New London and grew up in a farmhouse just a couple miles away from the road where Amy's body was found. He was a science teacher at the Nord Junior High, which was only 30 minutes away from Amy's school and he was a known volunteer at the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center around the time of Amy's disappearance. So Dean's ex-girlfriend says that Dean called her the night that Amy went missing and was acting really weird. He was asking her if she had heard about the case and anything about Amy. He specifically named Amy before the case had even made the news. So how did he know that Amy was missing when it hadn't been announced. So she had actually asked him about this and was like, what? I haven't heard anything about it. And he said that he knew some, he had some family members that knew Amy's family. And then later he said that he knew Amy himself. The woman also mentions that he had not come home that night and he was a very routine person. He was always home at the same time every day. He didn't randomly go out and like party or go to bars for him to not be home on this night in specific was really abnormal for him and he didn't give a good explanation as to why he wasn't home that night after hearing about this police end up bringing dean in for questioning and at this point he's like 60 something years old so if he has done this he's went majority of his life getting away with it scotch-free as soon as police bring him in, he does not appear innocent. He was very wishy-washy with his answers, saying when police asked him if he knew Amy's mom, that he may have met her at a bar and maybe didn't know who he was talking to. And when asked if he had ever called Amy, he said, I could have and not known who I was talking to or I called the wrong number. But later he ends up saying that, yes, there is a possibility that he called Amy at some point. If it isn't already obvious, when taking a polygraph, Dean failed and showed lots of signs of deception, but even with a polygraph that isn't like an end-all be-all, polygraphs could be inaccurate and they are a lot of the time, so even though it could be helpful later on, it's not like an end-all be-all, oh he failed, he definitely did this. Either way, it's something to note. Another note is that Dean also had a big similarity to the man in the sketches of the person who took Amy that the girls described. On top of all this, he was also identified in a lineup by multiple witnesses that were there at the strip mall that day, the time of Amy's disappearance in the mall, as being the man who was seen with Amy. If all that isn't enough, remember those, those yellowish gold fibers that I said medical examiners found on Amy's body? Well, Dean had a golden Grand Prix at the time of Amy's disappearance that matched the description of a vehicle seen near the dump site when Amy's body was being found. Even though Dean seems very suspicious and all these connections and coincidences almost seem too much, all the evidence is circumstantial. Even after getting Dean's DNA in 2019 and searching a storage unit of his, they found no solid evidence or proof that linked Dean to Amy up to the this point Dean has not been arrested he now lives in Florida as a restaurant manager and maintains his innocence another theory that is floating around is from a man named James Renner he had actually taken a great interest in Amy's case when it was on the news he was only 11 at this time, but he has dedicated his whole life to searching for clues and getting justice for Amy. He even wrote a book with all of his findings 
and this theory is one of his theories that he has investigated and found. So around the time that Amy was taken in Detroit, Michigan, which is only about two and a half hours away from Bay Village, a pedophile ring was active and James Renner believes that they could have taken and killed Amy. In 2005, a man named Ted Lambergine, I don't know if I'm saying that right, was pulled over by police just 10 miles away from where Amy was taken, and this is in Parama Heights. Police had already been following him in the weeks previously, whether that was because they suspected him of being in this pedophile ring or for other reasons, I don't know, but either way, they pulled him over and they took him in for questioning. When he was taken in for questioning, an informant ended up telling police all about the terrible things that this Ted guy was involved in and that he was indeed involved in this pedophile ring all these years ago. So this man has definitively been linked to this pedophile ring that was running only a short distance really away from where Amy lived and this guy is one of James Renner's suspects and he wrote about him in his book. His book has so much incredible information, things that I'm not going to talk about and that I'm sure a lot of people will miss and he has really spent so many years following leads and trying to get to the bottom of Amy's case. James Renner, the investigative journalist, believes that he can leak link Ted to multiple of his other suspects in Amy's case because they all frequented this adult bookstore at the time of Amy's disappearance. So these are the main two theories that I saw going around and that people believe could have happened to Amy. Again, nothing is confirmed. Right now, police are really just focusing on the angle of science and DNA. Literally every few months, new DNA technology is coming out and police believe that this could really help solve Amy's case. And it has been proven very helpful in past leads and connections in Amy's case, like being able to connect the curtain to definitively to Amy. So marking almost 33 years since Amy's case in October of this year, 2022, police announced that they began retesting a piece of evidence in Amy's case. What piece of evidence we don't know yet, but they say that it'll take four months to get a result. So hopefully in February or March, we will get some sort of answer or some sort of advancement in Amy's case. Police believe that Amy's killer has most likely done something along the lines of this before, whether that was sexually assaulting girls or stalking or maybe even kidnapping, and then maybe it escalated to a killing, or maybe he could have even killed girls in other states and it hasn't been linked but they do believe that he had previous experience along the lines of this crime. Even with all these leads and it seems like so much circumstantial evidence, three decades later, Amy's abduction and murder still go unsolved and her parents are still waiting for answers. Unfortunately, because of the amount of stress and grief that Amy's parents were dealing with, Amy's mom ended up turning to alcohol and already having an autoimmune disease called lupus it just did not mix. In 2001, Amy's mom was unfortunately found dead at only 54 years old, and she will never be able to live to see Amy get justice. Amy's dad, Mark, however, still holds hope that justice will be served for Amy in his lifetime. He even believes that it will be solved soon, like in the next few years, because throughout all three decades of Amy's case, all these sporadic leads and new information, the FBI has kept the case open and active. Amy's case is actually the longest active case in FBI history, and they still get 75 to 100 tips per year, and like I said, new technology advancements are coming out every year, and I'm hoping, and I'm sure that all of Amy's family is hoping that these can be used to finally get closure and justice for Amy. That is the end of this case, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. I'm sure that we are all hoping for justice for Amy's case, and I will keep you guys updated if anything new comes of this new evidence retesting in the next few months. And if you guys have any case suggestions, make sure to comment them down below. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.